Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. It is clear when examining the prophecy of Isaiah that his words were not for the Jewish people alone. He speaks about many nations and different peoples. And frequently, as we have seen, he has harsh words against Jerusalem and Judea, the nation of Israel. And likewise, he has harsh words for other nations. And what's the purpose of these difficult, strong words? Well, prophecy. When we study it, overwhelmingly we see that the primary message is repentance. Judgment and the threat of judgment is to bring people back to the truth. Now, Isaiah, his words that he shared, the reason why he spoke about these other nations and the judgment that they were going to be under was for Israel to take these words even to their enemies in the same way that Jonah did. And in this chapter that we're going to study in this lesson, we're going to focus in on two primary cities, the cities of Tzur, Ve, Sidon, which is Tyre and Sidon. And one of the things that we all know is that these two cities, they were coastal cities, port cities, in the nation of Lebanon. So take out your Bible and look there with me, the book of Isaiah and chapter 23. We're going to see that this 23rd chapter begins as so many within this section, and that is with a word of a burden a weight that God will place upon a people, a city, a nation, because he is displeased with them. And when we read prophecy, we need to ask ourselves and make this personal, what about me? Is God pleased with me? When God looks at my thoughts, my words, when he examines my deeds, is he pleased or Will God place a burden upon me individually? Because he wants all people to practice repentance, to turn away from those things that are displeasing to him, and to obviously embrace the truth, the word, the commandments of God. Let's begin once more. Isaiah 23, beginning in verse 1. Burden of Tyre. This is Tzor. And as I said, it is a coastal city, a portal city in Lebanon. He says, the burden of Tyre, and then he says, well, which is a term of lamentation. So he calls that city to wail, to lament. Why? The ships of Tarshish. Now, Tarshish, we don't know the exact location of that. But because Tyre, it was a portal city, there were ships going in and out, and it was that maritime trade that made this city wealthy. And make no mistake, it was an exceedingly wealthy, prosperous place. But realize, Something was going to change that. And what was that? God's judgment. So these ships, these large boats, and the word here, oniot, has to do not with a simple boat, but a ship. One that would carry commerce back and forth between places. And this is what Tyre was known for. It was a portal city, but 
it was rich in trade among different people. And God was saying here to lament, to wail because he was going to place a burden upon this city and that burden would indeed affect the ships of Tarshish. For this place is going to be, and the word here can be plunder, to be stripped bare of everything of value, and it's a term of destruction. So this burden upon Tyre is one of destruction. And he says that it is going to be plundered from both house and this is word entrance, which is probably a reference to the port itself. So destroyed is going to be the homes of this city and the port of this location. From the land of Kittim, this is probably Cyprus, it is going to be revealed to them. Meaning that from Cyprus, they are going to hear that destruction is coming. That there's going to be judgment placed and this judgment is going to devastate this city. So it's a call to repentance, but it's going to be only for the remnant. This judgment is going to be intense and leave the vast majority of individuals without life. A strong judgment. Look now to verse 2. We have the word domu, which is to be silent, to be still. In other words, what this word is conveying to us is that there's no way to avoid it. They have passed, as we've seen several times prophetically, the judgment that God announces, it's already been determined it is going to visit upon that nation, that city, upon that people, and such is the case here. So he says, be silent or be still. Dwellers of, and the word E usually means an island, but it can also mean a, a coastal city, a port city. So be silent, be still, O dwellers of this port and the merchant of, and we have a change. Now we go to Sidon. So these two places along the coast in Lebanon, Sidon is, is somewhat further north than Tyre. These were two key places. And through these two portal cities, we see that, that much of the wealth of Lebanon was brought in. They were known, and if we pay close attention to the language, in the middle of verse 2, we have the word socher. This is the merchant, the commerce of this place. So it was not primarily an agricultural town. It dealt with the trade of agricultural products. But as I said, it was maritime. It was shipping that made this place and the trade that went on within both Tyre and Sidon. He says, pass through the sea. And here, the next word, and this is why it's important to not just uh, look casually at the text, but if you read this, and I'm reading from Biblica Hebraica Stuttgart. And this is what modern scholarship sees as the preferred text. Now, oftentimes when I'm teaching, I'm teaching from the Masoretic texts. And we see here that there's a difference. Because when you look here at uh, Biblica Hebraica Stuttgart, we see the word mil uch, which is you being filled. But the Masoretic text and the Dead Sea, and we know that the Masoretic text is, is older than Biblica Hebraica Studengart. But when we look at the Dead Sea Scrolls, we find something. They have this word, and it's spelled very similar. But it says, your messenger. So when we read it carefully, based upon the best 
manuscripts and the one that that truly makes sense for the the context what we read is your messenger is passing through the sea and that messenger is one of of judgment it's coming that's the message that they are receiving look now to to verse 3 in mighty waters is the seed of Shehor. Now, Shehor is seen connected to Egypt. And the message here is this. Egypt was, a, again, a very prosperous place, having great wealth. And there was this go-between, via shipping, between Egypt and this location and the cities of Lebanon. And what he's saying here is this, that there's going to be judgment upon Tyre and Sidon, Sur and Sidon, and because of that, what's going to be the outcome? Well, this one, the the harvest of the Nile, its produce, it shall become a marketplace. It was a marketplace for the nations. So what it's revealing to us is this. It was Egypt's prosperity, and Egypt had much agriculture, and it would send its ships to Tyre and Sidon because this was the chief marketplace along the Mediterranean for Egypt. But what's the problem? If God is going to judge Tyre and Sidon, it is also going to have an an adverse effect and outcome on Egypt. That's what he's saying in this location. Verse 4. Be ashamed, O Sidon, for says the sea. So this is a poetic language. For the sea has said, powerful, is the sea saying, the powerful sea has said, you have not labored, literally. It's quoting, I have not labored. I have not given birth. I have not raised up uh, uh, young men or exalted virgins. Meaning, this, this city, although it was exceedingly prosperous, they had not done the work to be made prosperous. It was something, as we'll see, that was done to them, for them, in their behalf because it also served the interests of others. Oftentimes, nations, and we'll get to an empire in a moment, sometimes they are landlocked or the access they have to the sea is another body of water. And we need to realize that, that Lebanon was strategically, strategically located for Africa, for Europe, and for the Middle East. So those who were farther inland, inland, they wanted a port, and they built up these places. And therefore, we read here that Sidon, you should be ashamed, it's saying, for thus said the sea. That's the implication. It's already been determined. This stronghold of the sea saying, is speaking to this this city, saying, you haven't done something. You have not been able to say, I have have, uh, had labor. I have given birth. I have raised up young men and have exalted, lifted up, and that's esteemed, uh, virgins. You haven't done any of this. Verse 5, and therefore when, when the report is, is to Egypt, Egypt's going to hear this judgment. What are they going to do? Well, they too are going to, to be in pain because of this. They're going to suffer. The word here means to, to wreath in pain, to suffer great pain, the, the inhabitants of the coastline. They are going to realize what's happening when they hear the message of of Tzor. Verse 6. Pass through, O Tarshish, 
and well, O inhabitant of the coastland. So over and over because of the judgment that is being placed upon these two Lebanese cities, Tyre and Sidon, we see that there's great lamentation. It goes beyond them. And this teaches us an important principle. And that is this. My sin can affect others adversely. Because when I'm judged because of my sin, not only will that affect me, but those that that depend upon me, those who are related to me. This is what he's saying. Verse 7. Now, verse 7 is the word hazot. It's the word ha is the word the or the. And the word zot is this. Now, we cannot say in English, the this. But in Hebrew, when we have standing alone, the term hazot, we're speaking about the primary thing, the main aspect of of a given section of Scripture, the primary revelation. And he says here, this is to you, and it's a word Aliza, Aliza, that word means joy. And this is how Lebanon, and especially these two cities, they were full of joy. Why? Because others built them up, others made them prosperous, and they reaped much of the benefit of others' labor. And because of that, they had much joy. So we read here that there's a primary message, a happening to you, O joyful city. And notice what it says, Mimei Kadem. This means that, that their history goes back. They have had a long uh, history of prosperity, success, wealth, of great joy because of that. But what God is saying is, payday's coming. This is a time of judgment. And all that you had that made you joyful is going to be taken away from you and this this was your your heritage this is what you've had and experienced from long ago but now your feet your feet will basically transport it removed from afar uh, in order to dwell what now we're learning is because of this judgment that's going to be upon these two port cities, what's going to happen? People are going to to leave it, abandon it, because there's going to be nothing left. A strong judgment upon this place. Verse 8. Now, who's the source of it? What is bringing this about? Well, we know it's the prophetic word of God. God has evaluated these two cities and because of their resistance to producing the will of God, because of that, judgment's coming. Look at verse 8. For who has counseled, and this word, ya'atz, it's counseling, but it's also a proclamation. It is saying, basically, it has a, in this context, a prophetic aspect. We see in some of the prayers in the morning in the synagogue, it speaks about God who has counseled, and what it means is that he has provided information. He has given revelation, and that's how it's being used here. Who has has counseled this? Who has uh, suggested this upon Sor, that is Tyre? This one, and it's a word here for a crown, like a king's crown. It's the city that that has been crowned. It speaks about its exaltation and the authority, the power that this place has. But when God speaks against it, it is going to be brought low. And that's what he says. Who her merchants were, were high officials, And another word for merchants were the honorable of the land. So in the past, when we look at it historically, the merchants that came there were not just normal people. 
but they were and the word here that is used is for a high government official in other words there were these high government officials from what government various governments throughout the region and when they wanted to go and shop and buy the finest things where did they go survey sidon tyre and sidon and also their merchants were seen as the most honorable ones upon the earth not the most honorable merchants but it says simply here that they were the the honorable ones they were very influential verse 9 once more the lord's proclamation the lord of hosts i do not vote and whenever we see that that expression realize i do not vote the lord of hosts is is not a term we see in the law of moses it is usually a prophetic utterance in regard to god meaning the prophets use this name of god the lord of the armies it speaks about god's power his ability to carry out the words that he says so the lord of hosts once more verse 9 the lord of hosts he has counseled concerning her to profane the pride and all the beauty to make to make light that is to to make it low to to put a a less to to her beauty make it less than it was and all the the glorious ones of the lamb so judgment and everyone's going to see the judgment of god that's placed upon her now we have an image of what the people are going to do look at verse 10 pass through your land as and this is a river but it's specifically a reference to the nile river as the nile river would would pass its flow was a strong one it would move quickly so it's speaking about the nile river or a mighty river and he's saying pass through your city your nation your country and what are you going to see O daughter of tarshish and and the word here is mezach which is a ancient hebrew word for power meaning there's no longer anything desirable all of its power its prominence everything that gave it resource has been cut off by god there's no longer power anymore verse 11 how did this come about it says his hand he stretched out upon the sea and he this is of course god he shook kingdoms the lord commanded to and here we have the merchant city now the word in many of your bibles will have the word canaan realize the word in hebrew it's canaan it can speak of the land of canaan the promised land but not in this context that same word can speak of a merchant and it's speaking about the merchant city now how do we know that is that just an interpretation that is just pulled out of someone's mind well i would present to you that others see it that way many english translations don't but the basis for that if you look carefully at at verse 11 where it says the lord commanded and this is word to or against the merchant city to destroy and here's what we have strongholds but but at the end of this word strongholds we have a third person singular possessive pronoun which is her so her strongholds well the word merchant is masculine so it's not referring to the land of canaan that's out of context but rather it's a reference to the term canaan meaning merchant and because we have her later on we know we're talking about the merchant city so these uh terms and and understandings just don't come from interpreting based upon what someone thinks there are grammatical 
textual clues within the text that lead us to the conclusions that are reached. Verse 12. And he says, no more will you any longer rejoice the one who is now oppressed. So the key here is this, and this goes back to just looking at scriptural, scriptural, scripture generally. And, and my intent is this. Normally, when one is prosperous and wealthy, they take that prosperity, that wealth, and they use it for oneself. They, they don't give consideration to the one who is oppressed, the widow, the orphan, the stranger. And so God is saying, because of this prosperity that you've enjoyed for so many generations, remember, from the days of old, the ancient times, we find that this, this unwillingness to utilize the resources that they received. Now God, because they were concerned for the one who was oppressed. Now she's known. It's the scripture. The measure that you measure with will be measured back upon you. So God says, no longer will you add joy the one who is now oppressed. O virgin of Sidon, as as Cyprus, and this is Cyprus, who rises up and passes also there, you will not find rest. And what this means is this. This one who is now oppressed, it will pass through all the way over to Cyprus. And if you look at a map, you'll find that, that, that Sidon and Tyre, if you simply go westward, on the Mediterranean, through, through the Mediterranean, it's not very far until you come to Cyprus. And Isaiah is revealing that these people, because of the judgment, this burden that's placed upon them, it says that, that they are going to rise up and pass over to Cyprus. But also there, there will not be any rest. You will not give, and it's God, he will not give rest to you. Verse 13. Behold the land of the Chaldeans. Now, remember what I said a few minutes ago. When we went back up to, and let me close quote this once more. When the word of God says concerning Tyre and Sidon, that uh, it didn't really achieve its own, its own success, its own prosperity. Remember in verse 4 where God says, Be ashamed, Sidon. Why? Because you did not uh, uh, suffer labor. You did not give birth. You did not uh, uh, raise up young men or uh, young women. Now, it's in the first person, I. But he's quoting, he's saying what the problem is. And therefore, we now have the answer on how did this place become so wealthy? Who was the one who invested in it? Well, now verse 13 answers the question. Behold the land of the Kastim, that is the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. Now, Babylon had, that empire had, of course, a very powerful river. And we know that they utilized that. They also had access to water, but way up north. This was not the most prestigious or the most prosperous place for it to have access to the sea. Therefore, knowing the strategic location of Tyre and Sidon, what the scripture is teaching us is that the Chaldeans, that is the Babylonians, this is the people that in invested in them and that's why it says behold land of the chaldeans this people was not meaning tyre and sidon it was not a mighty people if it wasn't for the chaldeans it was the assyrians assure that uh, uh 
established it, and this is a word for founding it, for, and the word here, tzim, which is a naval term. Now, many other Bibles translate this word differently. But if you do good research, it has to do with naval, with uh, uh, once more maritime influence. So the Chaldeans, they invested, and also the Assyrians because of the strategic location of these two places. They are the ones that erected towers. They also raised up her palaces, but it says she was put to a fall meaning she was laid rest, uh, made to fall down. Verse 14, lament, and this is the second sign we see this, lament, O ships of Tarshish, for plundered, this means destroyed, devastated, uh, is your power. So once more, we see how Tarshish, which many see, we don't know the le- exact location, but was another portal city that uh, uh, traded with Sur and Sidon. So when they fall, it affected as well Tarshish. Look to verse 15. And it will come about on that day. Now, remember, that day is a reference to judgment. It can mean the great day of judgment at the end or simply another time of judgment before previous that great day of judgment in the last days. Verse 15, And it will come about on that day that sore she will be forgotten for 70 years as a day of one king. Now, what's it referring to here? It's referring to King David. David lived 70 years. And this one king, almost all the rabbinical scholars, the sages of old, many Christian scholars agree with this. They see it David. Look at the context. Once more, verse 15. And it shall come about on that day that Sur will be forgotten for 70 years. Now, 70 years is also the Babylonian exile. And in the same way that Judah forgot King David, did not adapt what he was teaching, did not have a kingdom uh, mindset. Because of that, Judea went into exile for 70 years. And for the same reason, these people, they did not embrace the kingdom reality. Therefore, they are also going to, for 70 years, see themselves as, notice what it says, but for as judge, but at the end of 70 years, it will be for Tzor. We began with that. It says it will be for Tzor. This is Tyre as the song of a harlot. Now, the difference is this. At the end of 70 years of the Babylonian captivity, God renewed his covenantal promises to the Jewish people. He brought them out of exile. That is, he redeemed them. But this is not going to be the case for Tyre and Sidon. And we know something. When we think of the best days of these two cities, they've been in the past for a long time, for more than 2,700 years. They have seen a, a judgment that they have not rebounded from. So look again, verse 15, and it will come about on that day that Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years as the days of one king. And at the end of 70 years, it will be for Sor, that's Tyre, as the song of a harlot. Now, what is a song of a harlot? 
Well, this is one of the ways that she would uh, advertise, that she would, would, would make known of her uh, occupation and call to clients, potential clients. And it says in verse 16, speaking about this same city, take a violin or a harp and go through the city, O forgotten harlot. So many years have passed. Just think of an old aged harlot. And Isaiah says, play well and, and multiply your song on account that they will remember you. So you better play well. You better multiply, play often this song, this, this uh, uh, old harlot, because they don't remember you've been forgotten. So play this song so they will remember you. Verse 17. And it shall come about at the end of 70 years, the Lord will visit. This is such an important word. It means that God is going to be strongly involved. But how? Well, for the Jewish people who have a covenant, God gets strongly involved to visit and redeem. When it's before the exile, he visits and he strongly places judgment. So this word simply means God's going to get involved and he's going to do so in order that his will will be fulfilled. Once more, verse 17. And it shall come about at the end of 70 years, the Lord will visit Tzor, that's Tyre, and she will return. She will return to her, and it's a word here for her harlot or prostitute's wages. And she will play the harlot. She will be a prostitute once more with the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the land. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means that even though God, he restores, what is, she, what is this place going to do? It is going to not remember judgment, not repent, but go back to its former ways and be a merchant and, and play the harlot, that is, be a source of idolatry for the kingdoms of the earth. No change, no repentance. Verse 18, our last verse. And it shall come about that her wages and her harlot payments. So everything that she earns in this adultery, this harlotry, through this idolatry, all of that, it says, Kodesh Ladonai. It is sanctified for the Lord. Now, how do we understand that? God is going to take it from them and he is going to give it to a people. He is going to strip bare once more because they never learned anything. They didn't repent. They didn't amend their ways. They didn't put God's prophetic truth, apply it to their life. So they go back. Once more, they're successful. They're earning this wage, this, this harlot wages. And it says, all of this is going to be holy to the Lord, sanctified. It is not going to be stored up, meaning by them, and it's not going to be placed into a, a storage house. The word here can be, it won't be placed in a treasury and it won't be placed in a storage location. Why? Because it is for the ones who dwell before the Lord. Now, this is revealing something. You know, there's a lot of false teachers that talk about a wealth transfer. And they mean it in this age now. But that's not what the scripture says. This is going to be something that's done at the end of the age where God is going to take those that did not learn truth and he is going to take away their earthly prosperity 
And he is going to provide it for those who, notice what it says, who sit before the Lord. It will be her her, uh, uh, wages, but it's going to be given to those who sit before the Lord. What does that mean? Those who study at the feet of God, those who learn the truth of God. And it will be for them for food, for satisfaction. You eat and you'll be satisfied and also for a covering. And notice this last word, a tik. This is a word for a, an elegant covering. It has to do with that which is, and some will say, a tik is not so much elegant, but if you check carefully, also the word durable, that which lasts. So God is going to take, and the promise is this, at the hand of God's judgment, there's going to be in the last days indeed a transfer of wealth. It is going to come to the people of God in the kingdom of God, and it's going to have these fleshly or physical uh, resources are going to have a change where they bring about satisfaction and they last, they endure in the kingdom of God. That's why Messiah tells us not to store up blessings and and wealth upon the earth, but to do so in the kingdom of God, where they don't wear out, they can't be stolen, but they are durable, they last. So in this 23rd chapter, this judgment upon Tyre and Sidon, we see some practical words that should cause us to reflect upon our behavior and repent and turn to the statutes, the commandments, the instructions of God. Because what we do not do in obedience, whatever we gain through disobedience, God is going to take that away from us. Realize there is no lasting profit, no true prosperity in disobedience to the word of God. Well, I'll stop with that until next week, and we continue on in our study of the prophecy of Isaiah. Shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.